Good morning. Good to be here again. Last time we were here was, as Pastor Brian said, in April, and at that time we were preparing to leave uh, for Africa. And so we've spent the past year there. Um, last September, we, I took the big step of quitting my job at Delphi, and uh, we moved to Zambia, Africa. And you can see the picture there with the, the family that went with us. We still have four other children who were in various other places, but Peter and Keith did come with us. Peter is the one that we took to college yesterday, and Keith is going back with us to Zambia at the end of this month, or at the end of September, actually. And uh, just so you know, we don't have an end date. We're not planning to come back any time other than to visit the U.S., so we'll see how that goes. So when we took that, <clears throat> that big step, the thing is, we felt that we were being called by God to move to Africa and completely change our lives. Not everybody is called like that. In fact, most people, like you, are called to stay here. But it's because of people like you who have been supporting us with your prayers and with your finances that we can go to Zambia and do the job that we're called to do by God. And in fact, we know some people there in Zambia who are not as well supported as we are. They don't have the people behind them like we have with you guys and other people. And they're always wondering, you know, what are they going to do for the next month? Where are they going to get their, their money so that they can live? But because of what you guys have been doing for us and other friends of ours, we can concentrate on the work that God has called us to do. So I'm going to spend some uh, time here telling you about what has been happening, what God's been doing there at Kafakumba, and then afterwards, Cassie will share some of her observations of what it's been like for us as new missionaries out in the field. So we have a big vision at Kafakumba. It's nothing less than the transformation of Central Africa. Now think about that. That's a big vision. It's a huge vision. I mean, we're just people here. But we have a big God, right? And he's been doing some big things at Kafakumba. So what I'd like to do is spend some time showing you and telling you what's been happening there. First of all, we have almost 200 workers there between the Kafakumba Training Center and the various businesses that we've started. Those are people that are just locals who had no other source of income, but because of Kafakumba, they've been able to have a job and provide for their families. Most of them live in homes like this in the nearby towns of Pisenge and Baluba. Now, before Kafakumba started there, there was probably a couple of thousand people in these homes. That's what it looked like back in 2000, the town of Pisenge. Now, since Kafakumba has been there, you can see that it's grown quite a bit. In fact, those two towns now, Pisenge and Baluba, have about 20,000 people living there. And a lot of it is because of what's happened at Kafakumba. When you start providing jobs for people, they bring their families in. When those families come in, they need food, so you need markets, you need services, things like that. So the place has just kind of built up on itself and has grown this much, and there's been a huge impact of, there from the work that's happened at Kafakumba. I'll just quickly flip through some of the slides showing you the things that are happening there. Uh, one of them is aloe vera. We've got about 30 acres of aloe vera plants on the property. And the aloe is processed and bottled right there at Kafakumba, and it's for drinking. You can put it on your, on your skin if you want, but the main purpose is drinking. It happens to provide 20 of the 22 amino acids that you need, provides lots of uh, minerals and sugars, and it really boosts the immune system. There's a lot of people there who have AIDS. They drink this stuff, and it doesn't cure the AIDS, but it makes them feel well enough that they can actually you know, live a, a fairly normal life. Another thing, uh, we have a tilapia hatchery there. In fact, it's the biggest tilapia hatchery in all of Zambia. And in the inset there, what you see is a picture of some of the eggs that have been harvested from the mouths of the fish there. The stuff in the background, that's part of the hatchery itself. So there are 200,000 fingerlings grown there each month. And there's actually 28 fish ponds built there now. Um, 11, of them have, 11 of them have water. The rest are still to be filled. But each of those ponds is about an acre and a half in size. And so the fish get to about that size. It's about the size of my hand. Um, it takes them five to six months to grow to that size from the little fingerlings, and then they're just sold at local markets for about $3 per fish about that size. That's our son Peter looking at one of the ponds there. And Africans love fish, so everything that's produced is just is sold out immediately. Also, oops. also, we have 100 acres of bananas. You may have heard um, of those in the past. There used to be a lot more, but they were attacked by something called the bunchy top virus. And so that virus has killed a lot of the bananas, but we think we've uh, solved the problem now, and they're doing really well. There's a picture of some guys carrying a couple of the bunches of bananas. 
We also have a wood shop there, and here's a picture of some of the products. We make doors and windows and trusses also. Most of the customers are the big copper mines that are there in the area, uh, and then also there are some individuals that like to buy these things. Um, because of the copper mining industry in the past, we've had some problems, and uh, it's starting to pick up again, so we're hoping that this, this business will take off again. Also, I think many of you know Ken Vance. He raises chickens there. He does several hundred a month or every couple of months. And one thing that's interesting, they discovered that the big demand for chickens there is not for frozen chicken, but for live chickens. So that's how they sell them. They take them to the market in a truck and just call everybody over, and they just grab a chicken, and you'll see them carrying them back with their, you know, dangling by their legs. Well, actually, they hold them by the wings like Ken is doing there. And then also we have a business with, with uh, honey and beehives. This is a picture of a bunch of swarm boxes that were made there at Kafakumba, again with some of the African workers. So far we've made about 6,000 beehives and given those out to about 1,400 villagers. Actually 4,000 of the beehives are out in the field. We teach the villagers then how to care for the bees, how to harvest the honey, and, um, and how to uh, process and then give it to us. Actually they sell it to us and then we process that we put it into bottles like that. They're sold in the local grocery stores. One bottle uh, goes for about, uh, well, it's $2 a pound. You can buy that honey here for about $3 a pound. And one of the things we're really proud about with this honey is you can tell it's really nice and golden. It tastes better than the other honey that's there available. Uh, it's cheaper, and, it, and it's a much better quality. So this is actually one of the gems of Kafakumba because we just give these beehives to the villagers for nothing. And out of that, they're able to make an income. And we depend on each other. Without them, we wouldn't have a honey business. And without us, they wouldn't have a honey business. This past May, we harvested about 12 tons of honey. That's a lot of honey, right? That's about as much as six young African elephants would weigh, if you can imagine that. And the demand is great. I mean, we didn't have any honey for a few weeks before that, and people were always saying, when's it coming, when's it coming? And as soon as it was there, you know, it flies off the shelves. Now, one thing I want to point out is all of these businesses here are designed to help the local people. They provided the jobs. They provided sources of income for the villagers and the people that live near us. But the primary purpose of Kafakumba is not this. Okay, the primary purpose and really the key to meeting our vision of the transformation of Central Africa is the pastor school. And this is a picture of the graduating class from pastor school. These guys come from local villages, a lot of them uh, where there's no electricity, no running water. The pastors come from places that we would never want to go, and they come to this pastor school, learn how to preach the gospel, go back to their villages, again, where none of us would ever want to go, and spread the word of Jesus Christ. Now, what I'd like to do is show you a short video that I made from this past pastor school, which took place in May and June, and you can get a feel for what actually happens there.
that's that Alfred Shella. Uh, I've been uh, at this school for eight years. Today I have graduated and uh, I believe that uh, I will continue doing the work of our Lord because this is the work we have been given to do. They are teaching us a lot of things. We, even, we've, we have even started the computer classes, which is a big challenge to us. I, I want to save people, to, to, be, to call people to come to Jesus and uh, to have uh, the, the kingdom of God. Yes. Kafakumba Pastors School is one of the wonderful schools which we can consider to train the pastors and to send them out to do the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what it was like. So every, every year, uh, up to 100 pastors and their families come to Kafakumba, and then they stay there for six weeks. Now that's like 250 people. Our population goes up by 250 people for six weeks. It's a lot of work for us. But as I said, these people are the key to the transformation of Central Africa because they go back and tell people about Jesus Christ. So I want to tell you a bit about what our role has been there at the, uh, oops, wrong button, at the center. Cassie has uh, been spending time doing Bible study. She started a women's Bible study. That's a picture up in the upper left. And then also has been involved with the ladies' sewing class. She's been teaching them some things like knitting, for example. They're actually making uh, knit hats and, and gloves and mittens things that we didn't, never thought they'd use in Africa, but it gets pretty cold there. Oops. Peter, our oldest son that was there, he's been working with the fish hatchery, and he's also been working with the honey project. He's gone out into the bush a couple of times and helped some of the people with their honey harvest, and then he's also been teaching some of the boys there how to read. Our youngest son, Keith, who's going back with us, he's the computer expert at Kafakumba. so whenever visitors come, he's the guy that gets them all hooked up to our brand-new high-speed wireless Internet system, Nothing as fast as here, but it's pretty good compared to what we had. He also has helped, uh, he's up in the upper corner there, he was teaching, uh, helping to teach a computer class. That's the new lab that we set up. There's, about, there's 12 computers in there right now, and he's helped to do that as well. I have been working with uh, the businesses and uh, mainly uh, involved in the management, and then also the guys there standing in a circle. I meet with those guys every morning at 7 o'clock, and we have a song and we pray. And then uh, when we go back, um, Pastor Kalembo and I will be taking over the management of the woodworking shop as well. Uh, this is a picture of uh, one of the classes I was teaching at pastor school. I taught a, taught a music class and a computer class. And then also, we recently started an English church service there at Kafakumba. And so Cassie and I lead the praise team. I'm shown there uh, playing the keyboard. Our son Peter was playing the guitar. And you can see we've got a bunch of the Zambian children, or uh, youth, I mean, who are part of our praise team as well. Now, our primary response, oh, one more thing. The other thing we've done here is we've started some monthly dinners up in the top left corner there. Um, the next one there is, oh, interesting story about those dinners. I sent a text message out to remind people about our last dinner. And on it I said, okay, you need to bring your, uh, your cups and your plates and your silverware. So I got a message back from one of the Zambians. He says, you know, I've been looking in my wardrobe and I can't find anything silver to wear. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> Now, before, I had sent the messages for a dinner before that, and I said, okay, bring your table service. So I got another message, is, what do you mean by that? So I thought I was making it better by saying silverware. But cutlery is the word they know. And then on the bottom picture there, we also started some movie nights. So we actually have, a, a, we just project a, a movie on the back of the auditorium, and it's like a drive-in theater. So that's been pretty neat. So our primary responsibility, though, has actually been managing the, tra the training center with Pastor Kilembo, who's the director. And so Cassie and I, we handle all the money for the training center. We cover the bills, we purchase the materials, we pay all the salaries, and we also direct the construction of the center. So I want to show you some of the projects we've been involved in since we got there last September. The top picture there, that's our house. When we arrived, uh, there was an add-on that hadn't been finished yet. It only had walls and no ceiling or anything, so we finished that off. The bottom one is another guest house that, that we finished while we were there. And when I say we, we're not swinging the hammers, okay? We have a construction crew, so we're, we're, we're directing that. Although we do, do some of the labor, but not much. Okay, this is the center. Have any of you been to Kafkumba before? 
<laughs> okay, well, before we got there anyway, this area that has this, the steps and everything was just, just dust, basically. And so we've done some landscaping. We put those steps in there. Uh, you see those guys there, they're working on a, a Methodist cross and flame that's also going to be a fountain. And there's a bunch of walkways there. Uh, we've been doing some things like that children's building on the bottom there. We put some ceilings in and painted them. And uh, that other one is a dormitory that we're finishing off. Uh, here's some more construction we did, a new toilet block, uh, a new office for the pastor. We've been remodeling some of the guest areas. So there's been a lot of stuff that we've been doing. Um, what I'd like to do right now is just introduce you to some of our friends and neighbors. And these are the people that are benefiting from the things that Kafakumba is doing. This guy here, Pastor Katembo, is one of the students from pastor school. He graduated a few years ago. And he's one of the guys who's making a difference in the lives of the, the Zambians there. Just to give you an idea of how well he does, his congregation, the church, turns in a gross monthly offering of 15 to 20,000 kwacha. Now let's see it. 5,000 kwacha per dollar, that's 3 to $4 a month is their monthly offering. Out of that, see, the district gets 7,000 kwacha. These are United Methodist Church. The conference gets 5,000 kwacha. So that leaves three to 8,000 kwacha for Pastor Katembo's salary. That's 60 cents to $1.60. And he's one of the lucky ones who actually gets a salary. Most of those guys that went through pastor school, they don't get a salary at all. So you know they must be dedicated if they're willing to go through all this stuff to be pastors and go back and not make any salary at all. But like I said, these guys are the ones that are the key to fulfilling that vision of the transformation of Central Africa. Here's another guy who was a student at pastor school, Pastor Isaac. It turns out that, you know, since he needs some money, he also runs an electronics repair business on the side in his home. So he repairs TVs and stereos. Problem is, he does it out of his home and he has no electricity in his home. So how do you suppose he does soldering? He's got a little charcoal fire he takes a wire and heats the wire over the solder, over the, the charcoal, and then he just puts that hot wire on his soldering, on his electronic equipment. So that's how he does that. But again, he's one of the pastors. This is Sharon. She teaches the God's Kids at Kafakumba. Her husband and her baby both died of AIDS last year, and she has AIDS also. This is Royda. She's got a hair salon. And her husband graduated from pastor school last year. Well, right after graduating, he had high blood pressure, and he died of high blood pressure. This is Weissen. He's our human resources manager. While he was growing up, eight of his siblings passed away. This is Anna, his wife. While she was growing up, she lost three siblings. This is Stephen. He does a lot of plumbing around Kafakumba. This year, his 28-year-old daughter died of AIDS. That's Aaron. He's one of our security guards. This year, he had a two-year-old niece who died of malaria. This is Augustine. He's one of the beehive workers. He had five children. He lost one at age two. He lost another child at age seven. He lost another child at age 13. And he has two left. One of them is severely crippled. And the list just goes on and on and on. But these are the people that Kafakumba is helping. You know, we never experienced so much death since we, you know, until we went there to Kafakumba. Now it's just, just a part of life. And then there's the beggars. This is one of them. We call him Lazarus. Several times a month, he and other people come to our house just looking for food and for money. When he comes, he's just shaking because he doesn't have enough nutrition. And we can't understand a word he says, partially because of the language and partially because, you know, the elevator doesn't go all the way to the top. But that's very common. A couple weeks ago, there was a man who was doing temporary work <coughs> at Kafakumba. By temporary, I mean he's got a one-week job at Kafakumba. Well, his wife died last month. He's got six children. After his work week is over, which actually it's done now, no more income. Now what does he do? And we just run into this stuff all the time. All of these people need money. Everybody needs money. People are coming to us all the time asking for money. In fact, they're always trying to find ways to make money themselves. They'll sell garden produce, they'll knit stuff, they'll sew stuff and try to sell it. They even come to us and say, hey, you can make a little money if you do da-da-da. Okay, it's just this constant need for money. It just drives people to desperation, theft, all kinds of horrible things. But those are the people that Kafakumba is helping. 
Some of those work for us. Some of them are just there as volunteers. But because of the work that we're doing there and because of you guys in extension, these people are being helped. If Kafakumba wasn't there, I have no idea what they'd be doing, but many of them would be a lot worse off than they already are. And from what I told you, you can hear they're not very well off. So I just wanted to spend a little time there telling you what's, what we've seen at Kafakumba. Cassie's going to come now and give you our impressions of what we've observed as a difference between being here and there in our first year as missionaries. Yeah, my impressions are a little bit different <clears throat> because I actually came home for the month of May. We have a daughter getting married in September, and I came home and helped her plan her wedding. Um, so I, while I was home one day, I went from our house on a bike ride, and I went to a place called the Nickel Plate Trail, which is actually an old um, railroad bed that's been paved for a trail. And I, I was really enjoying being out there. It was a nice spring day. Um, but my mind kept eventually making the comparison between Indiana and Zambia. So what I would like to do is present you with a world of contrast. So first of all, I said, oh, you're bike I was biking. This is typical bike riding in Indiana. There is bike riding in Zambia. Or this, those are bags of charcoal that somebody's taking somewhere to try and sell. This is the nickel plate trail that I told you I rode on. This is purely for recreational purposes. Um, bikers or walkers, joggers use this trail. This is Jacope Road in Zambia, and this is the road that we live on. And if you would try and ride your bike on there, you would kind of have the whole washboard effect, okay? This is a lush farm field in Indiana. This is a field in Zambia, and this is actually our neighbor has a small farm, and he took us out there to visit. And you can kind of make out that there are still tree stumps in this field. Everything is done by hand. Um, the planting, the weeding, the fertilizing, everything is done by hand. And then you can see there's corn. They actually call it maize. When the maize is harvested, this is what he has erected in his backyard, and he's hired this guy to get the maize ready for milling or eating or selling, whatever they're going to do. So this guy has got this little shelter, and he's using a stick and beating the corn cobs. The corn comes off the cobs, falls down through the cracks into this pit that they've dug, and now it's ready to um, be bagged to sell. So. I don't know how many farmers you have in this congregation, but does this look familiar to anyone? <laughs> okay. This is the way we would typically grow a garden here. This is gardening in Zambia. Lawn mowing in here in the US. Lawn mowing or slashing in Zambia. And this is this is not uncommon. I mean, this is the way almost everyone does it, including the workers that get hired to do the side of the road. They're out there, crews like this, slashing eight hours a day. It's hard work. Difficult <clears throat> transportation here in the U.S. would be a family vehicle. Typical transportation for a Zambian would be, this is public transportation. Um, the bus is very full. You pay to ride this bus or perhaps if you're lucky, you can <clears throat> thumb a ride in the back of somebody's vehicle. A typical Midwest home versus a typical home in Zambia. This is actually probably one of the nicer village homes. And for you men, here's a typical hardware store here. Um, you can see a nice big aisle. Everything is out in the open. Typical store in Zambia. And uh, this is most of the store, okay? Plus, something that you maybe can't notice, but all that stuff that you see is behind counters. And it's that way because if it weren't behind counters, the people would stick it in their pocket and walk off with it, and it would be stolen. So I'd like to share a couple more contrasts with you that are not just pictures, but um, one is some economic comparisons. Unemployment in the U.S. right now, which we think is terrible, is about 9%. Um, 
Unemployment in Zambia right now is about 16 percent, and they think that's great. It's down from 50 percent in 2000. Um, and I can tell you that in the rural areas like where we are, uh, unemployment is much higher than that 16 percent. Minimum wage in the U.S. is $7.25 an hour, which works out to about $58 a day. Minimum wage in Zambia is 419,000 kwacha per month, which works out to about $4.05 a day. And I told you we have a lot of unemployment around us. People will come to our door regularly asking for work, or maybe they'll ask for piecework. And piecework is kind of anything that they can get to do for a certain period of time. Like, for example, uh, somebody might come to our door and we'll say, okay, we'll, we'll make a deal with you. We'll pay you so much to slash our yard um, or to do our laundry or something like that. And they will agree, and at the end of the day, you pay them, and the next day they're out looking for somebody else to give them piecework for the day. That's all they have. They have no regular unemployment. And the last contrast I'd like to make is, is, is a real personal story for me, and it really strikes me when I look at some of the Zambians. You see, in 1993, I had a medical emergency. I was 28 weeks pregnant. I was going into labor, and I was bleeding. And I drove myself to the hospital, and within less than an hour, our son Keith was born by emergency C-section. Keith and I are both fine today, but if I had been a typical Zambian, my biggest problem would have been transportation. You see, if I'd been in a village, and I'd have gone into labor like that, and I would have known that I needed some care, um, first of all, I wouldn't have a vehicle. I might possibly have a friend that has a vehicle, so I might try and call them. And if I was lucky, they would have enough, they would be home and they would have their vehicle and they would have enough fuel in their vehicle to actually make the trip. Okay? If, none, if those things didn't fall into place for me, I would have to walk to the side of the road to a, a bus station, wait for public transportation and get to the hospital. Now, if I could get to the hospital, um, which for us, we have a car, is only about a 30 minute drive. If I could get to the hospital on time, I would actually receive good medical care. They do have it. Uh, Indola is where I would go. Indola is the third largest city in the country. So medical care is available, but more than likely, I would never have made it and Keith and I would both be dead. So back to my bicycle ride on the Nickel Plate Trail in Fertile, Indiana. Like I said, my mind just kept comparing the two, and I kept thinking, so why can't Zambia be more like the U.S.? And my point was not that Zambia should look just like the U.S. or become a mini U.S., but, you know, what was holding them back from, from, from some of the prosperity that we have? Zambia has a lot of resources. We live in the copper belt. There are copper mines. So copper is one thing. They also have cobalt, zinc, emeralds. They have good farmland, water, and they even export hydroelectric power to some of the surrounding countries. So what keeps them from prosperity? And so again, comparing, I thought of U.S. history. Well, the U.S. hasn't always been prosperous like this. When the early settlers came, they built by hand one-room log cabins that they lived in, you know. Um, they cleared the land by hand, very similar to what the Zambians do. And then even in the early, or even in the 1930s, this country experienced, um, whoops, the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl. And uh, my own mother talks about having eaten meals with potatoes and grease drippings. They couldn't afford meat. You know, and that's, to me, in my mind, I was thinking that's not that different from a typical Zambian meal of enshima and relish. Well, one of the things that I've done in Zambia is I've attended the women's school. Bill showed you a picture. Um, some of the things that they've been learning are, are bemba, English, Bible, math, sewing, beadwork, knitting, and embroidery. Here's just a couple of pictures. 
Uh, many of these skills are totally new to the Zambians, and if they can learn something like this, it can help them to earn a little bit of money to help put food on their tables for their families. And in fact, out in the back, there's a table with some placemats and pillow covers. Those were made by the women in the women's school, and if you would donate to that, or if you would like one, you can donate to that project and the proceeds will go directly back to helping them to buy materials to keep this school going. And then in June, I had the privilege of attending a women's seminar that was put on by two women from the U.S., actually. But there were about 60 Zambian women who attended, and I learned so much in there about Zambian culture by listening to what the women shared. But one of the things that came out and just really struck me was the lack of trust in Zambia. Women don't trust their husbands, husbands don't trust their wives, and friends don't trust their friends. In fact, if someone begins to prosper, their friends will be jealous of them, and they might steal from them, or they might just try to be totally discouraging to them. So I asked a question in this women's seminar. I said, I know Mercy. Mercy has been attending the, the women's school, and I know that she has learned how to sew, and I know that she has the ambition and would like to save money and buy a sewing machine so that she can actually have a business and produce something. I said, if she succeeded and got that sewing machine and got that business, would you be happy for her or would you be jealous of her? What do you think their answer was? Yes, they would definitely be jealous. They would be happy for her as well, sort of, but that jealousy would be a big factor. So to think, compare again the U.S. and Zambia, I, I kept coming back to, well, you know, the United States was founded on Christian principles, emphasizing honesty, integrity, hard work, and helping your neighbor. Zambian culture comes from a background of witchcraft, jealousy, fear, and there is also a fair amount of laziness in there. In Zambia, if my neighbor prospers too much, it's probably because he or she is a witch. Or if something bad happens to me, if I get sick, it's not anything of the consequences of my behavior, even if I get something like AIDS. It's because somebody put a hex on me. So, you know, where do we fit into this as a family? Well, some people have talked to us about how wonderful it must be to be, see people come to Christ. Well, actually, Zambia is a Christian nation. It's been thoroughly evangelized, and if you meet someone on the street, they would tell you that they're a Christian. But culture, uh, cultural ideologies die hard. So to put the shoe on the other foot, if someone came to you and told you, that lightning is not caused by an electrical discharge, but it's caused by witches? How many of you would believe that? Ah, okay. Well, but the opposite is true in Zambia. Really, that's what they believe in. And so consequently, even though they say they accept Christ, when times get tough, they are very likely to go back to that witch doctor and ask them to help them or to put a spell on somebody else. They still beat their wives and children. They have major problems with alcoholism, and they, men tend to have girlfriends even after they're married on the side. So I recently read a book with a quote from a man from Zimbabwe, and the quote was, Africa's Christianity is a mile wide and an inch deep. In other words, everyone will say they're a Christian, but they may not know what that means, and they may not put it into practice. Compared to that to um, Jesus' great commission, where he says, go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. In other words, it's not just about saying a prayer and saying I'm saved. It's about transforming your life. And at Catholic Kumba, we're trying to teach and model what it means to live as a Christian. So back to the U.S., when I was here in May, I was attending our home church, and one Sunday that I was there, um, one of the guys in our congregation stood up and talked about how important it was for our Sunday school program to flourish. And, I, you know, it, the question is, why did he feel, 
like it was so important to stand up and say that. It's because our Sunday school numbers are going down and some of our young people and some of our adults who are coming into the church as well are coming in, they're sitting in the pew, they're saying they're saved, but they're not really studying. They're not really becoming disciples. They're not really learning and teaching and learning all that Jesus has commanded. So I thought, you know, are we becoming more like Africa? So on that bike trip, there were two things that kept haunting me. One is the disparity between the U.S. and Zambia, and how can we work to overcome that? And the second thing was thinking about how our churches sometimes treat God's word. Will somebody sometimes say that America's Christianity is a mile wide and an inch deep? Thank you.